Ladies, today I'm talking to business coach Martin Stella, who coaches ambitious entre entrepreneurs who want to make a difference in the world. Martin, welcome. Thank you for having me on. So, ha so happy to have you here. So one of the key things, like one of your um, specialities is sales coaching for ethical people. Mm -hmm. um, and you help people increase their skills by applying things like ethics and integrity and empathy which I know is something that my audience in particular is going to really love mm. to know more about. So I'm really excited to dig into that into our, in our conversation. And, uh, but before we go into, you know, some questions, is there anything else that you would add in your words to, you know, the work that you do and what you help your clients with? Well, that's a very broad, uh, question. I don't know what, Think of it as your elevator pitch. Like, how would you do that? Elevator it? pitch. Yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> I am Martin. I'm an ex monk who became a business coach and sales coach, and I help people fall in love with enrolling people. Oh, I love that. That's the mini pitch. I love it. I love the falling in love bit. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. And so you mentioned you're an ex monk, which is something that I'd really love to know more about. Tell us, you you, you were actually a monk and lived in a monastery for twelve years, yes. right? Um, I'd love to know what bearing that has, if any, on the work that you do today. Oh, wow. It's the foundation of everything that I do in my work, in how I organize my life, how I handle my, my, you know, my, my home, my space, the relationship that I have. It's, it's um, in, in Spanish, I live in Spain, and there's this expression here where they say, a cambiar el chip. So, you know, to change the chip. And that's basically what happened in those 12 years, that, that I got a, a software update, like a, in a new just operating system in how I approach um, essentially everything to do with life, with people, with relationships, communication. It was a really, really harsh learning of the, the automatic dominance of the ego and i don't want to get into the metaphysics of it all uh, but over time i learned how how easy it is to think that you're doing something for somebody else when in reality you're looking out for yourself mm -hmm. and you gradually discover that no there's so much self-motivation self-focus self-benefit in the things that we do and, and, and that really has been the most profound shift. Not that I've become more selfless, you know, I couldn't say that, but I'm now a lot more aware of how much ego there is in the things that, that we do and that I do. And so having that knowledge, that awareness that I might be a nice guy, but I'm also still very much a human being and I make mistakes and I need, I want to, become more mindful of other people and their reality and their need and what they're struggling with. So that is the foundation underlying the work that I do. Mm. And, and that, that goes into the ethical enrolling. Yeah, look, uh, I might want to start working with someone uh, and I might think that it's really good for them to get my work because it seems to be a match. But it isn't about me or what I think. It's, it's about the other person saying, Actually, I've seen enough to know that this is what I want. It's, it's really always fully about the other person. And that approach makes it um, a lot more fun to have the sales conversations, to, to follow up with somebody who inquired, to, 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 to make a phone call with someone uh, that you only met briefly at a conference but you would like to continue the conversation, right? You're, you're going in because there's something about that person that matters to you. It's not about, do you want to get something from them? Do you need? No, there is a, there's an other driven motivation underlying your, your decisions, your messaging and, and the actions that you take. Hmm. I love that. I mean, that, that underlying, you know driver for me i mean i would summarize it as the word service you know being, being oh yeah hell yeah oh absolutely and so I, lo I love what you're sharing there something that's really interesting in terms of the thread you know when you talked about ego and how it 
permeates every aspect of our lives but but you know being a business owner and an entrepreneur it's that is you know rife breeding ground for the for the ego um so something that occurs to me that people i think struggle with is um how do you not make it about yourself so you know how do you how do you let go of um you know ego and the self when it comes to to selling is there anything you could speak to i don't know if it's possible to let go okay. of ego. i mean if you don't have an ego you're not a person you're not alive right it's your mind your awareness your memories your body without that all of that composes your ego and so you can't you cannot be without one and i think well, compared to, to, to um, meditation in the sense that sometimes people say, oh, I don't know how to meditate because I can't concentrate or empty my mind. Yeah. That's not what meditation is for. Mm -hmm. Meditation is for saying, I will think about this. Oh, my mind is there. I'm going to bring it back to this. Hey, it happened again. I'm going to bring it back to this. Mm -hmm. And this process of constantly redirecting your attention when you notice it slipped away, to this one single thing, whether it's a mantra or a statue or, or um, whatever is the thing that you meditate on, is the practice to go back to that one single point of focus. With ego and the self and the other person, yeah, you will end up always going back to thinking about your own interests or the idea that you have that you think the other one should see or the a misunderstanding on their side that if once they get it then they'll have a different opinion or reaction and so i need to get my opinion across and all of that makes it about yourself and that's fine don't beat yourself up you're a human being because once you notice that you're doing that you can say oh just like with meditation you bring your mind back you can say right i've been making this about myself again and what i'm thinking or what i'm saying but it's not about me, I'm bringing back my attention to what matters for this person. So it's a continuous practice of asking yourself, what do they need? Oh, it's about me? Sure. But let's think about them again. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's just a practice. Yeah, I love that. Um, I really love that. Something, that. something that comes to mind is, you know, you and I both work with eth you know, ethical people, the more conscious mm -hmm. business owner. And something that I come across is that people... Um, in that realm sometimes struggle with being overly concerned that you know what they're creating it's kind of it's a dual thing because they're concerned with themselves and what they're creating is it good enough is it gonna is it you know important enough can i char really charge that for you know what i'm doing all of that stuff which can seem like a concern for the other person but it, again it's still that focus on it's very much about yourself what would you say to that I mean, do you see that? Does that do you experience that with the people oh, yeah. you work with? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's that's a source of a lot of procrastination and um, uh, people undervalue themselves very often in in how they present things, how they price things, because the result gets connected to a sense of self worth. The result for the client. But whether you are smart enough or good enough or been able to create a course good enough, uh, yeah, that's about you and it's not about you. It's about if I put this in front of person A, who is you know, this type of person at this level with that interest, with those hobbies and uh, that business model, will this do thing X, X for them? Right? It's, it's not about who, is it good enough, it is, is it going to get the result for that person, for the, 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 the small group that I made this for? And if you look at it very coldly, then you will say, well, yeah, look, if I have to talk to a group of academics about psychology, that probably shouldn't go there because I'm not a psychologist, right? I'm, I'm, I wouldn't be able to, to, to hold my own in, in, in such a peer group. But if we're talking about a group of... Um, I know people have been on a retreat with a psychologist. They're at a completely different level. They're not academics, they're students. And I would show up with my view on psychological workings. Yeah, if it is you know, within a certain limit of, of, of the, the, the demographic, 
type of person that I want to work with. Yes, for those people, this training, this course, this ebook is going to show them things that are interesting, revealing, or helpful. Mm. So it's, it's, it's a very slippery thing, tricky thing to, to, to steer clear of this ego thing. And it's unavoidable, but you can notice it yeah. and redirect yourself to, no, it's not about me, about my worth, about the price. It's about what are they getting from this? Yeah. Yeah, and what that makes me think of is the distinction that you make between being a trusted advisor and mm -hmm. a salesperson. Um, and I love that distinction. Tell us more about that. Anybody who tells you what will be good for you mm -hmm. essentially violates your autonomy. And it doesn't matter if that... Um, is a relative or somebody trying to sell something or uh, your brother trying to convince you that you need to change something, whatever. Sure. Nobody has the right to tell you that you're wrong for the way you're doing things. And so at a very fundamental level, um, forceful selling, pushing people, manipulating, is a way to tell people that their view on reality is incorrect, yours is the right one, they need to throw away their view and adopt yours, and they need to accept your authority in lieu of their autonomy. That's not nice. You know, you don't mm. treat people that way. Um, repeat your question, please, because now I, uh, I lost track. Oh, the, this um, distinction between trusted advisor and sales. Ah, right. Okay. So if if you're going to want, all of us are. Uh, disposed to listen to advice if mm -hmm. it comes from certain people, if it is given in a tactful way, if we're being seen. So no matter who it is, if they approach you in the right way and they tell you, hey, there is this thing and if you want to talk about it, you might find it useful. Would you like to? Sure. Tell me your story. Right? What, what are you on about? If you approach a sales conversation in that way, then you're not taking anybody's authority, uh, 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 autonomy away. You're not forcing anybody. You're trying to learn what goes on in the world of that person. And they notice that you're not trying to push an agenda, let alone a sale. Now you're, you're trying to discover what this person is like, what their fears are, and their needs, and their frustrations, and their doubts and concerns. And in that conversation, they will start to appreciate you for the openness um, and, and the concern and care that you have for their state and their situation and needs, which causes them to open up the door to you. So the, the more you're non-pushy and genuinely interested, the more they start to trust you and give you permission to deepen the conversation. That is becoming a trusted advisor. So when you can have conversations, whether that's in person or uh, uh, on a video call or by email, conversations that make people feel seen and heard and understood, you end up building a shared vision. Mm -hmm. You have a vision for them that with my work, it's going to do that and that for you and it's going to get you the goals. But that's your vision. Don't push your vision on other people because it's mm -hmm. going, to, you're going to find a barrier. But if you have a conversation that has them buy into your vision, then you start to see both visions overlap, right? You, you create a composite vision of their world, the way you see their world, and how you match. And then in a very natural way, you, you facilitate somebody's decision-making because, because you're making it about them, you're, you're genuinely interested, and you're making it very clear that, look, you can walk away from this at any moment. I'm, I'm not here to convince you. Mm. If you want this, just say so. If you don't, we can continue talking today or next week. It's not a problem if your choice is I'm not buying this. So you're giving people not just, you, you, you don't just uh, respect people's autonomy. You're actually giving them the right to veto. You're telling people, well, if, if you're expecting this to happen, then it's not for you, because I've made this especially for people who want other things to happen. 
so it's the features and benefits if, if they're looking for. So you're being very specific about who this is for and who it is not for. And if it's not for you, do not buy it. Yeah. That gives you that trusted advisor uh, uh, role. It gives you permission. It builds trust. It causes a shared vision. And meanwhile, you're constantly making it very easy for people to disqualify themselves. Mm. To tell you, oh, well, if, if that is how the program works or what I should expect from it, yeah, no, then it's not for me. Yeah. And by doing that, you take away all the threat. It's, it's the exact opposite of the traditional uh, uh, sales types that we all know so well. We try to push you this thing and that thing. No, instead of going for the yes, trying to get to the close, no, you're telling people, look, I don't know if this is going to work for you. I don't know if any of this fits into your world. But would you like to talk about working together and see what that would look like? Mm. That's completely different than, well, if these are your problems and you want to solve those, and provided that you have the money and that you're ready today, then this is my program and it works like that and it's going to do that and that and that for you. And then you sit there wondering, why didn't they say yes? Well, they didn't say yes because you were trying to push an agenda. You threatened their autonomy. And essentially, on a, on a very fundamental uh, uh, primitive psychological level, neurological level, you're being a threat to their well-being. Mm. And most of the time, people don't notice much more than a bit of an uncomfortable feeling because I'm being sold something. But what's happening on, 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 on a much deeper level is that the, 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 the existence and the well-being of this person is being threatened. Not in an actual factual way. But your subconscious, your, your, your lizard brain doesn't know this, doesn't, it just scans your life and your environment for uh, uh, something that can be a threat or a boon, a benefit, uh, a mate, uh, food. And the moment something even smells like it might be possibly a threat, your subconscious will say, uh-uh, no. Mm -hmm. Because its job is to control your actions and decisions if your mind isn't able to make the right decisions. So it's got an overruling power over the rational mind. So in any situation where you are talking with somebody who wants to buy or might want to buy, you want to avoid mm, making that impression that there is something potentially threatening. Mm -hmm. And even something as subtle as, well, I have this great idea for you. Well, subtle, let's call it friendly and helpful. As I have mm -hmm. this great idea for you. you. can very easily trigger this subconscious reaction that, yeah, but wait, how do you know what's a great idea for you? Yeah. The moment that happens, you've already lost the, the, um, the balance yeah. in the conversation, in the relationship. So there's this uh, guy who talks about cheese, uh, cheese and whiskers. And it's a really nice, <coughs> simple analogy. If you show a mouse, uh, sorry, if you show a mouse cheese, they'll move towards it. If you show them whiskers, the mouse sees a cat, he's gone. Yeah. So in any situation, and that doesn't just apply to buyers, but in any relationship that you have, where you want to move forward with someone in some way, get some outcome, some result, are you showing them whiskers or cheese? Yeah. Now, what is cheese to them? We don't know. That's why you have to have the conversation, ask the questions. But you do know that if you say this, it could be whiskers. Yeah. And even if you don't know that, you can tell. Because you can tell by the reaction people give. If you come out with, great idea for you, let's talk about that. And you see them blink, shrug, move away. There's so much body language and micro expressions that yeah. tell that yeah, subconsciously something is being perceived as a threat, even if your heart is in it. It has only been the way you did it at that moment in that conversation mm. that for them, was something threatening. Yeah. No. Yeah. What comes, about them. yeah. What comes up for me there is that the cheese in that conversation essentially is the concern and care we have for the person in front of us. You know, it's less about the content of what's being offered and more about that sense of feeling safe, yeah. you know, as you say, to make the decision, which I love. Now, everything that you've described, I have direct experience of. You know, one yeah. of the things I love um, is how we got in touch with you, reached out to ask me the question, mm -hmm. how has integrity and ethics played you know has integrity and ethics played a role in either increasing your business or decreasing mm -hmm. um and it very much i have found that the, the more i've leaned into this this way of doing things the more the more successful my business is but my 
you know, I'm, whenever I'm doing a conversation like this, I'm thinking about the audience and what they might be, the questions that might be occurring for them. And there's got to be people out there who, who would think this all sounds wonderful and definitely a much nicer approach than what we're traditionally told to do mm -hmm. around sales. But if, how is that so? You know, how is it that this, this, uh, that we are taught to essentially apply the pressure, um, you know, create things like false scarcity, fear of missing out, all of that stuff. Um, because whilst I, you know, I completely agree with you, um, it, it, it is a threat for many people, but in lots of cases it's working. There's a lot of companies and business owners out there that use these, these strategies to, to affect. What would you say to those people who are, you know, who don't get why, you know, they see people succeeding with the more traditional manipulative ways. What would you say to that? Well, if somebody wants to use aggression, yeah, that works. If you're aggressive enough, you can beat a lot of people. If you're forceful enough, persistent enough, uh, you hammer the point, then percentage-wise, in the end, you will get the sales. Yeah. If you try to bully people into a sale a hundred times, sure, no matter how disagreeable it is, you will find people who need that thing and who are um, who are, well, I can't find the word, but who, who will succumb. Yeah. yeah, if that's what people want to do, yeah. it's not the kind of person I talk, I talk to. Um, and I know that it, it it's really, Awful to see that, you know, here is a nice person and I want to do right by people and I'm having these conversations and I'm sending emails and posting things on social media and yet I'm not getting all the sales that I want. Whereas that guy over there, uh, for lack of a worse word, uh, uh, is, is wheeling and dealing and he's making false promises or uh, manipulating people and he's getting the sales. How unfair. Yeah, that's indeed, that's very unfair. What are you going to do if you're a good person? But you, you will not go. If, if, if you're on a mission to do something good and you truly care about people, you will not go there. So then what, you're out of business because you won't be able to sell? What happens when, when you're in a situation like that, it's, it's what I call the good egg problem. Somebody who really respects their values and who respect other people very often comes comes to a point where they sabotage their own results because if i would ask someone a question for example like would it make sense to meet again next week it's it's a very friendly question it does advance the buying process if a buyer says yes but it's nothing pushy it's based on their permission whether there will be another call or not you're not trying to sell them on anything you're inviting them to continue the conversation now, a good egg, a good person, will very often avoid that question because, oh my goodness, what if I look pushy? What if that is out of line with my integrity? Can I really do that? So I very often see people who, the, the higher up they are in integrity, the more difficult they make it for themselves. And the solution is to let your integrity and your values lead the whole process. And that goes back again to the other person. Yeah. If you're a good egg, then you care about other people. That is a value of yours. So you go and seek out people who share that value, which means that from the start you have rapport because you share these values. And you have an implicit agreement that we don't, do not violate each other's values. We don't treat each other in ways that go against what we personally and shared consider to be uh, untouchable. Oh, and, and unassailable. Then, because of those shared values and because you show that respect, people's barriers go down. They let down their guards. And then the good egg problem transforms into something actually helpful. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, makes mm. perfect sense. Yeah, and I love the point you made there because I see that a lot that, you know, the higher a person that stands in their integrity, the harder they make it for themselves with, with things yeah. like this. And I think it's, it's in part because people have, are so aware and so, so, you know, sensitive to the kind of manipulation that's 
that's out there in terms mm. of business these days and marketing oh, yeah. that, that they worry that anything they do like that you know suggested another mm. conversation or let's talk again or let's deepen the conversation mm. could be perceived as as salesy and i love what you say about allowing integrity to lead to lead if you do that right if you start worrying about whether you come across as salesy and it keeps you what are you doing at that moment you're making it about yourself yeah Oh, do I look, oh, listen, you're, you're a good person. You will never want to be even remotely close to those kinds of people. Good. Now go and have conversations with people. Yeah, but I don't know how to sell my stuff. You don't have to sell your stuff. Your job is to have a conversation with people that they enjoy, that inspires them, that teaches them something, and that has them see why they would or would not want to know more or maybe even buy so that you facilitate their process of making a decision. So it's all about that person. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. And something that comes up for me um, is I, I read one of your articles where you talk about not, not you know, with, with, again, we're encouraged and taught to close the sale, to go for the sale. And it becomes this binary thing of no sale or sale. Mm -hmm. um, and what, what occurs to me as you were saying that is, you know, when it's a more, much more fluid conversation, and you know, the way I would describe it is, it's a, it is and can be a slower approach. Mm -hmm. um, but what we were talking earlier in terms of, um, you know, the traditional manipulative way that does get results, it may get short-term results, but long-term it erodes, it erodes the relationship. Oh yeah, um, it definitely does. Um, yeah, a, a gentle approach to selling does mean that the cycle. The, the process can take longer. Yeah. Um, but what would you rather have? Somebody who buys and feels uncomfortable about having uh, you know, experienced certain things, so now the money is in your account, and they're happy, but they also are left with something, um, I don't know, mm. yeah, the product is good, yeah, it's not too expensive, it's a good guy or girl, it was really, really a hard push to get me to buy this thing. Or would you want somebody who says, that was a really fun conversation. That was good. Um, I got something out of that. I wonder what he will say next time. Mm. If you leave somebody with a, a positive feeling from a sales conversation, they end up thinking with a sensation of, yeah, I feel respected by you. I'll, I'll talk to you again. Now, if you can have a conversation, but even if there's no sale, leaves people feeling like that, then the next time you phone or mail them, they're going to be, yeah, I remember you. How are you doing? Tell me more. Yeah. How can I help you today? Because it was positive. It ended in a positive way. The intermittent, the, 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 the space in between two meetings was nothing negative. And now here you are again wanting to talk to them. Sure. What do you got? Yeah. That does mean that it might take longer. But it also means that when somebody then buys, that has been... Mm, 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 nothing negative at all. In fact, it causes people to be so bought in to working with you that people renew, mm. right? I, I did some numbers the other day and I realized 80% of my clients renew, yeah. right? Instead of a, a three month program, I have people who've been with me for four years and I never sell anything. I just have conversations about what somebody needs. And then if they give me the signal that, yeah, maybe it's time to do something about this. Then I tell them, would you like to talk about what that looks like? Yeah. And they go, sure, tell me. Now, sometimes they buy, sometimes they don't. I don't really mind. Because I know that even if it's not a sale today, there's a relationship and it continues in a very positive way. And from that relationship can come a sale later down the line. It can be uh, an introduction. It can be a stage, an interview, hi. Uh, you know, anything can happen, really. I had a while ago a meeting with a guy in the UK, a consultant, and because I was you know, doing these interviews. Uh, it was a really nice guy. We had a lot in common, both in terms of psychology and spiritual, spiritual background. And he, he's an employed a consultant. He doesn't need me. But he's on my list. He reads my, my, my daily articles. He likes them. And at some point, he's like, oh, you're talking about sales coaching, eh? Well, you should talk to my friend because she just told me that she needs a sales coach. Mm. Okay. So I meet his friend. We have a conversation. 
you have another conversation, and she signs on. She had not ever heard of me before then. But because I am not trying to hunt something and then take it home, I'm not here to find people who will give me money. No, I'm trying to connect with people. Yeah. Somebody becomes so sympathetic to the way I work that the moment his friend says, who should I talk to? First one that comes up is Martin. So does it really matter that not every sale, uh, every conversation turns into a sale? No, it doesn't matter at all because so many other things can happen. Now I'm talking to, to a former client who became a really good friend about a joint venture project. Right? Yeah, I could try and sell her something again, and I know that she would be very happy because she, you know, she was a client already when we become friends. So it's not out of line to talk about something else, but why? I'd, I'd rather have the friendship. Yeah. And then see where that takes. I mean, it, it, it's a relationship that is important and valuable and mutually beneficial, yeah. also in terms of business. Right? So when I have a client who needs website work done, I'll send them to my friend, my former client. Yeah. And now she is telling me, yeah, we want to bring you in for a program and for a retreat, and can you be a guest expert? Sure. So we often think that selling is this binary thing, right? That either somebody says, yeah, here's money, or they say no, and damn it, lost another one. Yeah. Sales is not binary. Sales is about, it's, it's not about sale, no sale. It's about sale or something else. And this something else can be a sale tomorrow, it can be an introduction, it can be a friendship, it can be a partnership. It, who knows what's going to come out? But if you're looking to get a yes or get a no, well, the moment you get a no, things break, things stop, things stall, things become difficult. So try to, try to hold that person's decision as, the, as a sacred thing. Mm. But they need to make the right decision for them at this moment, whether it's a yes or a no. Yeah. You're here to serve them in the process of making the decision. And if you can be selfless about it, you'll gleefully accept a no. And when you do that, you will always be welcome to, to come back and talk to them. That is your trusted advisor. Yeah. Trusted advisor can walk in at any time and say, How are things going? What do the numbers look like? How's the campaign running? And you sit down with your trusted advisor and you take in what ideas they have. Yeah. And by being purely focused on their best outcome, their best decision, you create that role in their lives. I love it. One of the key things I think that for me, of what you said, is as well as having their you know, best interests at heart, it's this idea of, you said the words, I think it was, um, I don't really mind if I get the sale or not. And mm. that's so, um rare um mm. and it's and you know whether you say it or you just show up to the conversation you know with that energy people feel mm. it I, you know mm. I, I fundamentally believe people feel the energy of that um, oh, yeah. and that's what yeah. puts people at ease I have one one um question because i know and i know we're running out of time but um Everything we've talked about has kind of been centered around the conversation, you know, the sales conversation, which in some ways isn't really a sales conversation at all. Um, what would you say to people? Because I think um, a lot of the people I work with struggle to even get to that place of having the conversation with people. Is mm. there advice that you would give um, for people how to show up in their business? You know, because then people get into this idea of have to market myself in certain ways to then even get to the point of being able to have a conversation with someone is there anything you would say to that like how do you fill your diary with these conversations essentially how, how do you what how do you fill your diary with conversations mm. well that that's that's a, a, a i could talk for a day about that it's a really really broad question but yeah. Um, I think one of the things that might be helpful for people, um, certainly really helpful for me, is if, if you look at 10 people or 100 people who might want to work with you, whether you're a service provider or you have products or courses, you're going to find that there's only a couple of people in that 10 or that 100 
that make you go, huh, I would love to meet that person. How cool. Or what a beautiful branding or the message that they're giving. I just love their mission. Right? The Marie Kondo feeling like I'd love to sit and have a chat with that person. Yeah. And then there's a whole bunch of people that, yeah, it's nice, but if they pay me, I can work with them. Or um, they don't seem really friendly or they're not my kind of person. But yeah, my thing would work for them if, uh, if they buy it. Okay, forget about all those people. Go and look for people that wake you up, that make you come alive, that make you really excited to meet this person. And talk to them. Send them a message, uh, ask them for an interview, uh, uh, share something with them. It, the way you do it, well, yeah, there's a there's hundred different ways to, to create a connection with someone. But it will always be easier, more fun, and more effective if you start with people who are like you. This is the Seth Godin uh, uh, thing he wrote about a while ago, that people like us do things like this. Mm. Right? So search for people like us. Yeah. Not an exact copy, because somebody who's too closely similar to you isn't probably going to buy your thing. But people who have those things in common with you that make you excited about meeting this person. That should take the sting out of outreach and out of uh, uh, calling somebody up or following, following, following up with somebody. Yeah. Because yeah. you are not there to get money out of someone. No, you're there to connect with someone that you hopefully will have a good, beautiful, wonderful, whatever, inspiring conversation with, which, if we both enjoy it and it goes well, will lead to a point where you can say, would you like to talk about working together? It's, it's in that sequence. And you start with this personal, shared, um, sympathy-based, interest-based. Like, if you're not interested in someone, if you're not curious about what's going on in that other person's world, why do you even want to sell them anything? Why would you want their money? Just because it's money? No, you're a good person. So why don't you start with people who, from the moment you encounter them or their website, their social media profile, there is something in you that cares about them, mm. about something that they do. Start with that. I love that. I love that. That, that reminds me of one of my good friends and colleagues, Ellie Tria, talks about exactly what you're saying, and she describes it as hone in your kindred spirit radar. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, yeah, it's exactly mm -hmm. that. I love it. Yeah. So, um, Martin, it's, I love talking to you. Um, I know we could talk all day, um, but in the interest of time, we'll, we'll start to wrap up. I know that, um, well, well, first of all, I just want to check in and see, is there anything, you know, we've talked about a lot of things. Is there anything you would add, any kind of parting words of wisdom that you would leave viewers with today that maybe we haven't covered? Parting words of wisdom. Um... That would be an easy question to answer if I were a wise man. <laughs> <laughs> you, you throw these really <laughs> abstract, broad questions at me. Um, it's a joy. If, if, you, if you, you truly care about people and you approach your business and the people you come across and the sales conversations from the heart, then selling is in itself an act of service. Because you serve people in, in making a decision. In the process they learn, they experience something positive. So I like to tell people, get out of your head. Remember that it's not about you. And sell from the heart. You're here to serve someone with this conversation. I love it. Selling, selling is an act of service. That's probably going to be the title of the video. <laughs> okay. um, and then finally, because I know that you're working on some exciting things and you have your ethical sales system program, um, I want to make sure that people know, um, you know where to find you. So I'll have all your details. But is there anything with that, for example, any way that people could get involved yeah. with your stuff right now? Or? Yeah, uh, if anybody listening 
all this resonates with you, you can sign up for our daily emails. I have a short uh, article once a, once a day, uh, which goes into all of these things, but also mindset, uh, psychology. It's, it's, they're fun, apparently. People seem to like them. Uh, and I have a 10-week video training on this whole ethical selling course, which is in pilot mode at the moment. So I don't know when this is going to be published. By that time, it might be out of pilot. But people who want to know more about the program uh, can find information at martinsteller.com slash caroline. Um, so if you just fill your name in there, then I'll notify you the moment that I launch. And I think that's about it. Wonderful. Uh, you can sign up. You can follow me on Twitter, Martin Steller. Um, I like to make really terrible jokes there. So if there's a sense of humor, you can find me on Twitter. And yeah, I'd love to hear from people, even if you have questions, if you want to know more about something we talked about today, send me an email. I'm, I'm happy to uh, engage. Uh. Wonderful. Martin, thank you so much. It's been a lovely conversation and I appreciate your time. Really enjoyed it. Thank you.